Canada, a people's history. Proudly presented with the corporate partnership support of Sun Life Financial, Ascenda, and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. In the age of Queen Victoria, doctors prescribe a dark and powerful medicine to patients who are in pain. Isabella was in great agony all night and was obliged to have recourse to opium in large quantities. Isabella Clark MacDonald has become addicted to liquid opium taken in a glass of wine. She has been bedridden for almost her entire marriage to John A. MacDonald. It doesn't help that her husband is constantly called away to deal with political matters. John has started for Toronto last evening. I am, thank God, much better. But my head is confused and I am not sure what I say. The McDonald's moved to Bellevue House in Kingston, hoping for a new beginning. But Isabella never recovers. During the Christmas holidays of 1857, John A. McDonald is summoned to his wife's bedside one last time. Isabella is in God's hand, and there we must leave her. The death of Isabella MacDonald devastates her husband. He contemplates leaving politics for good. But powerful ideas are sweeping the land, and there are ominous rumblings south of the border that no one can ignore. Against a terrifying backdrop of civil war, 33 men must settle the fate of the Queen's colonies in British North America. It is a story of powerful personalities and a bitter political stalemate. One man, accused of treason in his youth, has become a passionate defender of the British crown. Another risks his life as he preaches peace. They know half a continent is theirs if they can overcome deep mutual suspicion and resist dangerous forces gathering on the border. This is a time of secret deals and backroom interventions by the powerful. A story of risk and seduction. A gamble to build a country from sea to sea. In the sleepy British garrison town of London, Canada West, Amelia Harris has spent another sleepless night. There appears to be a very great probability of war with the Yankees. 
If so, the country will be overrun. The thoughts of such a possibility keep me from sleep. Am I never to be free from care and trouble? As a child, she saw her family's farm destroyed when American troops invaded Canada in 1814. Now she is not the only one to worry. As the 1860s dawn, a sense of fearful wakefulness disturbs the British colonies of North America. Civil war has erupted in the United States. It will become the most destructive conflict the world has ever seen. There are barely four million people in the colonies. Most live within striking distance of the American border, in the province of Canada and the colonies along the Atlantic. On their doorstep, a nightmare of slaughter. The northern states against the slave-owning south. Brother pitted against brother. In Washington, President Abraham Lincoln is furious that Britain seems to be siding with the southern states. He considers opening war on two fronts, against the south and against Britain's colonies in the north. Some New Yorkers are itching for a fight with the British. In the event of England in her folly declaring war against the United States, the annexation of the British North American possessions will unavoidably follow. We could pour 150,000 troops into Canada in a week and overrun the province in three weeks more. William Seward, the Secretary of State, believes it is America's destiny to inherit the colonies. Nature designs that this whole continent, not merely these 36 states, shall be sooner or later within the magic circle of the American Union. In Halifax, journalist and politician Joseph Howe is terrified. Our cities would be captured our fields laid to waste, our bridges blown up, our railways destroyed. Our womenfolk would become a prey to a soldiery largely drawn from the refuse of society. But the people of British North America have no intention of being overrun. While the British army readies itself for war, Volunteers turn out in droves for the local militia. Amelia Harris also remains vigilant, for she knows the horrors of war. Mr. Griffin returned today disgusted with everything he had seen in the States. He brought his pocket full of rings, taken from federal soldiers' letters in the dead letter office at Washington. They say the rings are made from the bones of rebels' legs. They are worse than savages. As America spirals into civil war, Canada faces a political crisis of its own. The new Governor General, Viscount Charles Monk, is favorably impressed by the local politicians who will have to solve it. Political men as a class are in a lower grade of society than at home, but on the whole, I find here more knowledge, more ability, and I think quite as much, if not more, tenderness of conscience as amongst the same class in England. Georges Etienne Cartier stands out among his peers. He is worldly, urbane, and supremely self-confident. Around his neck, he wears a pendant with a picture of Napoleon. I am a French Canadian. 
I love my race and naturally have a certain preference for it. But as a politician, I can be partial to others too. Cartier is utterly at ease with the elite of Montreal, French and English. Financier Hugh Allen often meets with him. Cartier was not a man with whom you could talk very much, because in all interviews with him, he generally did most of the talking himself. And you could with difficulty say anything. Though a product of the establishment, in his 20s, Cartier joined an uprising against British authority. For his role in the Patriot Rebellion, he was charged with treason. But Cartier slipped across the border to the United States with other Patriot leaders. There, he had a change of heart. Georges Etienne Cartier, refugee, wrote to the colonial governor, swearing his eternal allegiance to the queen. Let me express my burning desire to return to my native land, to resume my duties as citizen and British subject. The former rebel now devotes his energies to a new cause, making Montreal a great commercial center of the empire. The establishment warmly welcomes him back. This city is inspired by the spirit of progress. Nothing can stop it from one day becoming the rival of all the great American cities. He makes an advantageous marriage to Hortense Fabre, uniting two families with deep roots in French society. But it is a loveless and lonely marriage. Hortense is austere, religious, and deeply uncomfortable in social settings. Even family friends find her distant. She was ill at ease in the world. And I'm inclined to think she would have been happier in a convent, providing she could be its mother superior. Just as her husband was happy in politics, as long as he was in charge. But Cartier is a fixture at all social events where he loves nothing more than singing songs he has written to the assembled guests. He is often observed by the young niece of the Governor General, Francis Monk. Mr. Cartier dined in full uniform. No one knows why. He sang or croaked after dinner and made everyone he could find stand up, hold hands, and sing a chorus. I asked Mr. Cartier his favorite occupation. He said, activities of the heart. What does he mean? Cartier always prefers the excitement of travel to life at home, and is quite content to go wherever his career takes him. Voters will elect him again and again as their representative. He works tirelessly on their behalf, rewriting property laws, creating a modern civil code, setting up primary schools for Catholics and Protestants, modernizing the institutions of his province. Wherever Cartier goes, the interests of French Canada are never far behind. In Kingston, an equally driven man is making his mark. 
John A. McDonald has overcome great sadness. In the past decade, he has buried his wife and his 13-month-old son, John Alexander. For a time, he retreats from society. But he is beckoned back and reappears in public. And is noticed at the theater by a young woman named Susan Agnes Bernard. I remember distinctly how he looked. A forcible yet changeful face with such a mixture of strength and vivacity. With his bushy, dark, peculiar hair as he leaned on his elbows and looked down. Born in Glasgow, Scotland, MacDonald has the dry humor of the old world. Though I have the misfortune to be born a Scotsman, still I was caught very young and was brought to this country before I had been very much corrupted. Since I was five years old, I have been in Canada. All my hopes and my remembrances are Canadian. From the earliest days, he reveals a genius for political persuasion, often around a dinner table or parlor. Amelia Harris is not impressed. The dinner is called a success. A great many people were there. The ministry stayed until very late and were very tipsy. They were Mr. Morrison, and Mr. Sidney Smith and Mr. John A. MacDonald. They knocked each other's hats off, tore each other's coats, and did several equally clever things. What a pity to see such men at the head of affairs in Canada. But even when at play, MacDonald is always at work. Politician Hector Langevin admires his political savvy. MacDonald is a sly fox. He's a well-read man, ingratiating, clever, and very popular. MacDonald is also calculating. To keep his Kingston seat, he joins the notoriously anti-Catholic Orange Lodge. But his career depends on an alliance with Catholics and French speakers. Politics is a game requiring an utter abnegation of prejudice and personal feeling. If we get the right man in the right place, it does not matter what his race or religion might be. Cartier and MacDonald become allies in the 1850s. Together they overcome the fatal flaw of the Canadian Union, the tendency for Upper and Lower Canada to thwart each other's ambitions. I believe in Johnny McDonald's sincerity. It is lucky indeed that two men should meet who are in such perfect agreement over how to govern the United Province of Canada. Cartier and McDonald share bold ideas. They want to build a transcontinental railway. And they muse about uniting all the British North American colonies, claiming the whole northern half of the continent. But a powerful obstacle stands in their way. An upper Canadian rival who accuses MacDonald of selling out his own people to the French. The country is young. There is no position a man of energy and character may not reasonably hope to attain if his will be strong and his brain sound. For many years, the greatest impediment to any MacDonald Cartier idea was a six foot four wall named George Brown. Born in Scotland into a literate liberal family, Brown absorbed talk of parliamentary reform around the dinner table. Printer's ink courses through his veins. He arrives in Upper Canada at 25, 
and goes on to found the most influential newspaper in the colonies. The first globe rolls off the presses in 1844. It becomes his mouthpiece, aggressive, uncompromising, saluting progress, suspicious of French Catholics whom he accuses of imposing their will on the rest of Canada. What has French Canadianism been denied? Nothing. Bars all it dislikes, it extorts all it demands, and grows insolent over its victories. A body of men whose policy is despotism, whose faith is darkness, whom all free men dread and all tyrants caress. Let them pass more nunnery and monkery bills. Squander the public money on every popish scheme the priests present. The system imposed by Great Britain in 1841 gave each half of the province of Canada an equal number of seats in the United Legislature, even though Lower Canada had more people. The idea was to weaken the political influence of the French majority there. But by 1861, Upper Canada has more people. French Canadians like Cartier now defend equal representation. Our union rests on the principle that two provinces can coexist with equal powers. Neither one should dominate the other. But the system doesn't suit George Brown. Now leader of the Grit Party, he begins a campaign to win more power for the growing English population. All over Upper Canada, people cheer him on. A new slogan is born, Rep by Pop, representation according to size of population. With all his force, Cartier opposes Rep by Pop. The Globe has vented on me nothing but libel and lies, so as to whip up the prejudices of the people. According to the Globe, Lower Canada is the curse of the country. If it didn't exist, Upper Canada would be happier and more prosperous. MacDonald, too, has detested Brown for years. I am carrying on a war against that scoundrel George Brown for abusing me for months in his newspaper. Soon there is political stalemate. Brown is making life impossible for MacDonald and Cartier, and vice versa. Within four years, four failed governments. We have two countries, two languages, two religions, two habits of thought and action. And the question is, can you possibly carry on the government of both with one legislature? Winter, 1862. Military crisis in the United States. Political crisis in Canada. Yet amid all the uncertainty, the colonies receive a continuing flow of settlers. The dispossessed are coming and bringing their own dreams. The first peoples of British North America are scattered across the land. On the west coast, and on the prairies, where Indian nations mix with the Métis, children of the fur traders and their Indian wives. The First Nations also live, hunt, and fish on their traditional lands on the East Coast. The Inuit in the far north. The keepers of statistics in the colonies are not much interested in the first inhabitants but keep careful notes about the lives of the white colonists. Of the roughly four million people living in British North America, about half are Catholic and half Protestant. French speakers make up almost a third of the population.
Most people marry in their 20s. Men promise to provide for the family, and women agree to submit to the authority of their husbands. Women have no more legal rights than their children. The average couple has six to eight children. Often, families lose one or more of them to disease. In mid-century, the citizens of British North America are joined by refugees fleeing oppression. In a generation, they will transform their adopted country. I'm on my way to Canada, that cold and distant land. The dire effects of slavery I can no longer stand. Farewell, O oh master, don't come after me. I'm on my way to Canada, where colored men are free. In the 1850s, American slave owners are on the hunt. A vicious new law gives them the right to pursue escaped slaves anywhere they want in the United States. Even northern cities are no longer safe havens. But on the plantation, word gets around that any slave who can slip across the border will be free. Slavery has been illegal in Upper Canada for half a century. Fearing a mass exodus, slave owners spread rumors of their own. Canada is a barren country. Abolitionists are cannibals. They get you darkies up there, fatten you up, and then boil you. For those willing to risk everything for a chance at freedom, Harriet Tubman will lead the way to Canada. There are two things I had a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other, for no man should take me alive. Month after month, Harriet Tubman spirits black safely across the border. They follow rivers, hide in swamps and forests. Always a fear of capture at their backs. Harriet Tubman threatened to shoot any man who tried to turn back. If he was weak enough to give out, then he'd be weak enough to betray us all and all who had helped us. And do you think I'd let so many die for just one coward man? On my Underground Railroad, I never ran a train off the track and I never lost a passenger. Hundreds follow Harriet Tubman to freedom. She is known as the Moses of her people. Slave owners put a bounty on her head of $40,000. In the cities and towns of British North America, anti-slavery societies spring up to welcome the newcomers. Journalist and politician George Brown is one of the founders of the Toronto Anti-Slavery Society. The existence of a professedly Christian and civilized nation of men-stealers is a disgrace, not only to America, but to the whole world. But sympathy for the new arrivals only goes so far. As they settle, curiosity and support fade. For every meeting in favor of abolition, 
there is another wanting an end to black immigration. Some citizens openly demand they be sent back. Let them be free in their own country. Let us not countenance their further introduction among us. In a word, let the people of the United States bear the burden of their sins. In spite of the hostility, a black community takes root. In Victoria, free blacks who have escaped California's racist laws form a regiment to defend British North America. Neither vettles, clothes, nor money. I received only a welcome. That was all I wanted, and I was thankful to get it. In the 1840s, disaster strikes the Irish peasantry. The potato crop fails. Year after year, famine haunts the land. Unable to pay their rent, families are evicted from their homes by ruthless landlords, often at the end of a battering ram. By the time the worst is over, one million people will have died of disease and starvation. Survivors are forced to emigrate. But the ships bound for North America carry death in their holds. Overcrowded and unsanitary, they are known as the coffin ships. The conditions in steerage horrify cabin passenger Robert White. Passing by the main hatch, I glimpsed one of the most awful sights I ever beheld. A poor female patient was lying in one of the upper berths, dying. I recollected remarking the clearness of her complexion when I last saw her in health shortly after we sailed. She then was a picture of good humor and contentment. Now how sadly altered. She had been nearly three weeks ill and suffered exceedingly until the swelling set in commencing at her feet and creeping up her body to her head. Her afflicted husband stood by her holding a blessed candle in his hand and awaiting the departure of her spirit. As they sail up the St. Lawrence, passengers get their first glimpse of Canada. But the ships flying the flag of disease do not dock at Quebec, but at a windswept island called Gros Isle. We landed upon the Isle of Pestilence, and climbing over the rocks, we passed through the little town and by the hospitals, behind which were piles upon piles of unsightly coffins. Many spend their last days at the quarantine station on Gros Isle, staring across the St. Lawrence at the land where they had hoped to start a new life. In 1847, 50 a day die of typhus, passengers and crew. 6,000 are buried on land or at sea. Robert White never forgets the words of one man kneeling at the grave of his wife. He said, By that cross, Mary, I swear to revenge your death. As soon as I earn my passage home, 
I will go back and shoot the man that murdered you. And that is the landlord. Many children whose parents have died are adopted into French Canadian families. Their names will live on. Doyle, Murphy, Ryan, Johnson. In Ireland, the famine gives rise to a movement called Young Ireland, whose members swear to free their country from Britain by any means, even armed rebellion. A young writer named Thomas Darcy McGee joins the movement. I am one of those who are called Young Ireland, a body of men whose worth will be better known 10 years hence than it is now. But the British don't wait. They quickly suppress the planned rebellion. McGee becomes a wanted man with a price on his head. Wanted, Thomas Darcy McGee, five foot three inches in height, black hair, dark face, delicate, thin man. But McGee has fled to New York. American cities swarm with survivors of the famine. Destitute, often sick, they meet resentment and prejudice. In the United States, there is no more sympathy for Ireland than for Japan. The people hate the Irish immigrant for his creed, despise him for his poverty, and underrate him for his want of learning. These are years of sadness for McGee and his wife, Mary. Years haunted by poverty, intolerance, and the deaths of three of their children. When he is invited to start a newspaper in Montreal, McGee eagerly accepts. He is desperate for a new beginning. Montreal looks upon you not as foreigners, but as children of their own household. Within a year, the Irish of Montreal have helped elect him to Parliament. It is 1857. Wiser and sadder at 32, Darcy McGee has left his revolutionary past behind. A new dream now inspires him. The one thing needed for Canada is to rub down all sharp angles and to remove those asperities which divide our people on questions of origin and religion. I look to the future of my adopted country with hope, though not without anxiety. We must show ourselves equal to the changes brought by progress. We are at the beginning of a new era that will eclipse all that has come before. In the early 1860s, Montreal is in the throes of an economic revolution. It is a place where people can transform themselves. William Notman arrives in the busy city, fleeing financial ruin in Scotland. But instead of seeking a steady job, he tries his hand at a fascinating new invention, the camera. Notman's lens captures an age of innovation, 
one that will change lives in many ways. Across British North America, innovators and risk takers see potential fortunes in all the new technology. Especially the steam-powered locomotive. The Grand Trunk, centered in Montreal, embodies the optimism of the era. Politician Georges Etienne Cartier is also the Grand Trunk's lawyer. Montreal is destined to become the great supplier of the West. Without railroads and canals, it would never be able to attain this glorious position. Cartier has frequent sittings at the Notman Studios. By now, William Notman has refined techniques that are making him famous. A neck brace keeps the subject's head still. The tiniest movement during the 30 seconds it takes to record the image will blur the perfection of the finished photograph. At $2 a sitting, photography is still the preserve of the wealthy. In 1860, the Prince of Wales visits British North America and has his picture taken by William Notman, who can now boast he is photographer to royalty. In just a few years, he has spawned one of the most successful businesses in North America. But for all the stories of success, there are others of deprivation and upheaval. When he was 21, a young pharmacist in New Brunswick witnessed something so shocking it haunted him for the rest of his life. The cry of a small girl etched itself on the memory of Samuel Leonard Tilly. There lay the mother, weltering in her own blood, her little children crying around her, and the husband and father under arrest for murder. And rum the cause of it all. Tilly resolves to rid the world of the evils of alcohol and devotes himself to the cause of prohibition. Fighting the alcohol habit is an uphill battle when booze is cheaper than clean water and where a dipper waits behind store counters, free to all good customers. Citizens are constantly lectured about the dangers of drink, but politicians barely seem to notice another problem that haunts the growing cities. In the 1860s, the poor are drawn to the new steam-powered factories, hungry for work of any kind. The owners hire anyone who will keep their machines turning, old and young. Some are expected to work for nothing during their first months on the job and the troublesome ones are beaten. If a child did something, like look to one side or another, the boss would say, you will pay 10 cents for that. 
And if he did it two or three more times, then the boss would take a club and beat him. As always, winter is hardest on the poor. When the ports freeze up and the factories close, there is little work to be found. The poor must turn to volunteers and churches for relief. One who tries to help is Jane Slocum, Mother Superior of the Grey Nuns in Montreal. Another winter of utter misery. The poor are starving to death. Scarcely a day passes without someone asking for shelter. I believe that if we had a shelter that could accommodate a thousand more, we could easily fill it. Every day, children are found abandoned on the steps of charities. Little is known about them. Some are Irish, their parents dead from typhus. Others from families too poor to feed or clothe them. They arrive, without names, on the verge of starvation. The number of poor abandoned children is also rising considerably. Can you believe we took in 729 last year? Incredible, isn't it? The Grey Nuns do their best to keep the foundlings alive. They name them, baptize them, comfort them at night, and watch them die. Alfred, born January 17th, deceased Joseph February 2nd. Born January 17th, deceased. John, born February January 19th, deceased. February 5th. Born January 19th, deceased. February 23rd. Of the 729 placed in their care that year, only 33 survive. In 1862, George Brown set sail for England on an extended holiday. He is 44, an upright, cheerless bachelor. He has not been home for 25 years. He will return transformed by his travels. On one of his stops, he looks up an old schoolmate. The two spend long hours discussing publishing and politics. But Brown is distracted by his friend's sister. Anne Nelson is 32, speaks French and German, and reads philosophy. She has an artistic eye and a cosmopolitan outlook. Within weeks, they marry. How well I remember every event of that day. The walk to the station to meet you the hope and the fear, the despair and the joy, changing every hour until all was settled in that delightful walk. In London, he will also take the time to study political masters at work. He learns how weary some British politicians have grown of their colonial burdens. One radical member of parliament blurts out what others are thinking. I want the Canadians clearly to understand that England would not be sorry to see them depart from her tomorrow. Brown returns from London with a new sense of urgency. I come back with a better knowledge of public affairs and with a more ardent desire to serve.
When the Browns arrive back in Toronto, word quickly spreads. As she steps into the carriage, Anne Nelson Brown is astonished to hear that thousands are gathering nearby, waiting for her husband. He quickly prepares a few words, themes he will often repeat in the days to come. After six months' visit to the noblest and best governed land on earth, I feel more than ever the necessity for upper Canadians of all shades of political opinion to unite. I trust that whenever the great interests of Canada are at risk, we will forget our merely political partisanship and rally around the cause of our country. Forget the minor differences which have The man so who has stood for sectionalism is suddenly calling for compromise and cooperation. We will pay more regard MacDonald decides to seize the moment. He and Cartier extend a hand to Brown. Critics warn Cartier to be cautious. Journalist Médéric Langteau believes Cartier is falling into a trap. In the embrace between the Upper Canadian Rhinoceros and Le Georges Etienne, we fear the latter has been gobbled up by the former. We even thought we heard the huge monster cry out just before he wolfed down his mortal enemy. At last, I can chew you up and swallow you down in one mouthful. You, your religion, and your race. Damn little Frenchman. But to the horror of the critics, a coalition takes shape, uniting forces that seemed irreconcilable. I consented to enter the cabinet with great reluctance, but it was such a temptation to have possibly the power of settling the sectional troubles of Canada forever. Brown will now play a major role in shaping the political future. The province of Canada must again be broken in half, he argues, becoming a looser federation of two. But why stop there, others ask. Why not include the colonies along the Atlantic and the vast territory of Rupert's land owned by the Hudson's Bay Company and beyond them stretching to the Pacific, British Columbia? It is an idea that inspires not just Brown, but all of the leadership, a country spanning the continent. Irish immigrant Darcy McGee gives voice to the vision. Look to the land next to Europe, Newfoundland. Again, away towards the sunset, lies the new Canada West, the field for another great province. These are facts, not dreams. Consult the map, and there they stare you in the face, demanding the helping hand of wise and intrepid statesmen. But the plan to remake the map of North America will have to overcome deep political rivalries. And face unexpected enemies. Perched on the cliffs where Wolf fought Montcalm, Colonial politicians struggle to create a country of their own. The passionate supporters of Confederation, determined to succeed. The desperate campaign to stop it. And the dawn of a new dominion. In the fall of 1864, 
something happens in Charlottetown that will be remembered for decades. After an absence of 21 years, the circus is in town. Ladies and gentlemen, Playmaker and Nichols Olympic Circus. Look at the array of stars, first class artists, and other attractions too numerous to mention. Two performances every day at 2 and 7 o'clock p.m. One week only, admission 25 cents. Days earlier, a boat has set off along the St. Lawrence bound for Charlottetown. On it, the most influential politicians in the province of Canada. George Brown is now in a coalition with a man he previously called a dried-up political weasel. He and John A. Macdonald have decided to tolerate each other. He has also made peace with a man he used to call a damnable little French-Canadian, Georges-Étienne Cartier. I was up at four in the morning to see the sun rise and have a salt water bath. We had great fun coming down the St. Lawrence, having fine weather, a broad awning to recline under, lots of books, chessboards, and so forth. They each go with different motives in mind. Cartier feels that if he can persuade the Maritimes to join in a union, together their population would balance that of English Canada West. Brown dreams about the end of French domination of English affairs, the end of political stalemate. MacDonald worries about American aggression. If the Maritimes will join Canada, perhaps together they can resist their powerful neighbor. They are eight cabinet ministers three secretaries, and with them, securely fastened in the hold, $13,000 worth of champagne. Persuasion will take many forms. We were running along the coast of as pretty a country as you ever put your eyes upon. About noon, amid most beautiful scenery, we came suddenly on the capital city of the island. But when they drop anchor in Charlottetown, no one is waiting for them. Everyone, it seems, is at the circus. Finally, they are noticed and a small rowboat goes out to greet them. The maritime politicians are conducting their own meetings to explore maritime union. They politely postpone their discussions to hear what the Canadians have to say. For several days, behind closed doors, they talk. Separated and isolated, the Canadians argue, the colonies are vulnerable, economically weak. Together, they could build a railway from the Atlantic to the Pacific. They are amazed to discover they see the world much the same way. But mostly, they come to know each other when they adjourn for the day, as they stroll in the woods or drink champagne by the sea. In a matter of days, the Maritimers and Canadians have persuaded each other of the advantages of union. What kind of union and on whose terms remain to be seen, but they are giddy with success. When I think of the nation we could become, if all the provinces were under one government, I see the emergence of a great Anglo-American power. As the delegates board their boats and the circus packs up, everyone is elated. But good intentions will soon be tested when the real work of nation building begins in Quebec City.
October 1864. Summer has given way to a chilly autumn. Politicians from Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, Newfoundland and Canada are gathering in Quebec City. Many arrive by train, rarely a smooth or pleasant experience. Endless hours rattling along at nine miles an hour. Mercy Coles, daughter of a delegate from Prince Edward Island, brings her diary up to date. We've just started in cars again, and one might just as well try to write on horseback. A special train met us, and we came into Point Levy flying. How can I describe my first impression of Quebec? We saw Wolfe's Monument on the Plains of Abraham, and the monument to the brave who fell at the taking of Quebec. It was pouring rain when we landed. The whole Quebec conference takes place under torrential storms. As the first order of business, delegates have their pictures taken. Local photographic studios quickly mass produce calling cards. Mercy Coles collects them all. All the gentlemen have been having their likenesses taken. Mr. Tilly was there. He gave me such a nice card of himself. Papa's is only tolerable. Mercy Cole's father owns a brewery. He once fought a duel with Edward Palmer, but because neither was a very good shot, they now sit on the PEI delegation together. Two are doctors by training, Charles Tupper of Nova Scotia and Etienne Pascal Taché from Lower Canada. Ambrose Shea of Newfoundland is a businessman and journalist. Many are lawyers, like Oliver Mowat of Kingston and Adams Archibald from Nova Scotia. Few are as skilled in the art of lawmaking as MacDonald and Cartier. They have a distinct advantage over the others. The maritime delegations include politicians of all persuasions. Government members and rivals have joined forces to protect their regional interests but Georges-Étienne Cartier has brought no critics with him. Of the 33 delegates gathering in Quebec City, only four are French. Cartier has decided he will speak for his fellow citizens. I never let public prejudice be my guide. I only consult, and will only ever consult, my own conscience. But Cartier does consult others. The railway barons are in town, hoping the delegates will agree to build a railway linking all the colonies. They spare no expense entertaining on their private cars, making the politicians as comfortable as possible. Cartier's most powerful critic is alarmed by the meeting in Quebec. Antoine Aimé Dorian leads the Rouge Party. The Grand Trunk people are behind all this. It is nothing more than another railway project designed to make a few people rich. But the delegates work mostly on their own, free even of London's influence. Most of what happens in the room overlooking the St. Lawrence is kept secret but a few notes taken during the conference survive. We have the strongest feelings in favor of Confederation. And as Newfoundland stands as the key to the Atlantic, it is in the interest of Canada that we should not be taken hold of by any foreign power. 
separated as we are, we cannot defend ourselves. It would be a great question if England would send an army to defend any province from invasion. When we bring the country together, all our means would be united to repel an enemy. We must, therefore, become important, not only to England, but in the eyes of foreign states, and especially of the United States, who have found it impossible to conquer four million of Southern whites. Our united population would reach that number. Is this the time for union? Now is the time, or we may abandon the idea in despair. While the politicians spend long hours and days trapped in the conference room, their wives, children, and servants tour Quebec. They visit the Quebec Seminary to view scientific advancements. How light can now be seen as energy. Microscopes that measure with mathematical precision. And the famous pendulum of Foucault proving to almost all doubters that the Earth rotates in constant, predictable patterns. For three weeks, the conference continues. And for three weeks, Mercy Cole spends each day dreaming of the evenings. The governor's ball is to come off tonight. They say it is going to be such a crush. Major Bernard tells me we are to have grand times. The first word, almost, he said was, I hope you have brought the irresistible blue silk. A journalist visiting from France is dazzled by Quebec City. I am leading a very dissipated life indeed. Grand balls in the evening, endless concerts. Young and old, everyone mingles together. The Governor General's niece, Frances Monk, casts a more cynical eye on the scene. I danced with Dr. Tupper, Prime Minister of Nova Scotia who trembled with nervousness as I whirled him through the lances. Old Coles is, I believe, a retired butcher, and, oh, so vulgar I could not describe him. He is grey-haired and red-faced, and looks as if his legs were fastened on after the rest of his body to support his fat. George Brown quickly retreats from all the fun. I have just come from a grand ball given by the Executive Council. It went off very well, but to me it was an insufferable bore. I've come to my quarters weary and worn and with a shocking headache. In the corridors and lavishly decorated rooms, delegates sometimes meet in smaller groups. John A. MacDonald and Kingston lawyer Oliver Mowat do much of the work drafting the clauses in the evenings in their rooms. Fifty of the 72 resolutions are written behind closed doors, chiefly by MacDonald. I must do it all alone, as there is not one person connected with the government who has the slightest idea of the nature of the work. MacDonald's fingerprints show he tries to make sure that Ottawa dominates the new federation. We have given the federal legislature all the great subjects of legislation. We thereby strengthen the federal parliament and make the confederation one people and one government. As the hard-working delegates join the revelers, subtle forms of persuasion continue on the dance floor. 
Edward Whelan, a delegate from PEI, watches the politicians at work. The cabinet ministers, the leading ones especially, are the most inveterate dancers I have ever seen. They do not seem to miss a dance during the live long night. They are cunning fellows, and there's no doubt it is all done for a political purpose. They know that if they can dance themselves into the affections of wives and daughters of the country, the men will certainly become an easy conquest. But the late night work of John A. MacDonald is making many maritime delegates uncomfortable. Prince Edward Islanders feel increasingly isolated. They had wanted the Canadians to help them settle a century old problem, buying out absentee landlords who own most of the island. But the leading Canadians are not listening anymore. Every motion seems to go against the interests of the smallest colony. It may be said that Confederation will go on without Prince Edward Island, and that we may eventually be forced in. Prince Edward Island would rather be out of the Confederation than consent to this motion. Other Maritimers fear Ottawa has been made all-powerful, the province is weak, Edward Chandler of New Brunswick doesn't like the direction the conference is taking. I object to the proposed system. You are proceeding to destroy the constitutions of the local governments. Tilly of New Brunswick is also alarmed. The government would take all the public property and proposes nothing in return. But if consensus is elusive, events in America, as always, cast a long shadow over Canadian affairs. Midway through the conference, Governor General Monk is called away to a crisis unfolding on the border. Confederate soldiers hiding out in Montreal have invaded the sleepy town of St. Albans, Vermont. They hold up several banks and flee back into Canada. For a time, they escape justice. Finally, Governor General Monk orders out the militia and the raiders are arrested on Canadian soil. But far from condemning them, Montrealers seem fascinated by the Confederate robbers and their leader, Bennett Young. Even the judge doesn't take the crime very seriously and lets them go free. They even keep some of the stolen money. Americans clamor for retaliation. The Chicago Tribune urges the North to invade Canada. Take Canada by the throat and throttle her. As a St. Bernard would, a poodle pup. The crisis gives fresh impetus to the delegates in Quebec. As the conference draws to a close, MacDonald once again hammers home the need for a strong central government. For the sake of securing peace to ourselves and our posterity, we must make ourselves powerful. The great security for peace is to convince the world of our strength by being united. In the final days, doubters around the table are silenced by the sometimes overbearing Canadians. An agreement is reached, for now. The language of the Quebec deal is cautious, 
legalistic, deliberately different from the revolutionary phrases of France and America a hundred years before. After many arguments, they agree to representation by population, a division of powers between federal and provincial governments, and peace, order, and good government for the citizens. Montreal MP Darcy McGee is proud of the balance they have struck. Our principle, distinct from the American, is founded on an equal union of authority and liberty. And our safety lies in the growth of the national sentiment that we are a people amongst the great peoples of the world. After 18 days, the delegates pack their bags and head home. George Brown jots a final note to his wife. Dearest Anne, all right. Conference through at six o'clock this evening. Constitution adopted. A most creditable document. A complete reform of all the abuses and injustice we have complained of. Is it not wonderful? The old French domination is entirely extinguished. Some will say our constitution is dreadfully Tory, and so it is. But we have the power in our hands to change it as we like. Hurrah! Cartier is confident, perhaps too confident, his constituents will applaud the results. This union we made in Quebec is the most just and equitable that could have been adopted in the circumstances. Yes, it will protect all our rights, all our interests, and will assure the prosperity of all the provinces. a magnificent structure is taking shape. Queen Victoria named this isolated lumber town the capital of the province of Canada in 1857, over the claims of more established places like Quebec and Toronto. The choice of Ottawa makes everybody equally unhappy, except possibly Ottawa's stonemasons. The buildings finally give residents something new to look at in a town known better for bad drains and mud. When it comes to confederation, the English half of the province seems immediately sold. They gain more representation in Parliament for their growing population, and a promise of new land when the West is opened. But in French Canada, Cartier's opponents are rising up. Clubs like the Institut Canadien echo with speeches dismissing Confederation. The most biting sarcasm comes from Rouge politician J.B.E. Dorion. Before Union, we had one Englishman standing in front of us. Now, we have one in front and one behind. With Confederation, we will still have one in front and one behind, and one on each side, and maybe even one sitting on our head. It is not merely a fight between old political rivals. A young journalist and lawyer named Wilfred Laurier also passionately opposes Confederation. 25 years ago, the French nation was more vigorous. It was united strongly French. Today it is weak, divided, not yet anglicized, but becoming so. We must use whatever influence we have left to demand a free and separate government. In the winter of 1865, the Rouge go from community to community, trying to stir up opposition. But their leaders do not have a clear alternative to offer. In the far-flung communities across French Canada, there is little time for distant political battles. A 
and the Rouge have a more powerful enemy than apathy. For years, they have been battling the Catholic Church over its unquestioning support of authority. Until now, the Church has been silent on Confederation, but Cartier says the Church must act. Have no doubt, the more events unfold, the more we will see the need for Confederation, so as not to be absorbed into the vulgar anti-Catholic democracy of our neighbors. Most of Quebec's bishops agree. They instruct the faithful to support Cartier and the new union, from the pulpit and in the quiet of the confessional. One eager priest reports on his efforts to Bishop Louis-Francois Laflèche. I gave my parishioners clear instructions, which were followed pretty well. I told them that they could not, in all conscience, vote for men they knew to be opposed to the new government. If they did, they would make themselves largely guilty in the eyes of God. The newspaper La Minerve makes a more positive case for confederation. The glory of our nationality is not in isolation. It is in struggle and combat. Do not let us seek to enclose our nationality by a horizon without grandeur. Confederation will render us free and masters of our own domain. In the end, Cartier and MacDonald put the deal to a vote in the provincial legislature. It passes easily, 91 in favor, 33 against. But the members from French ridings are split down the middle. Newspaper editor Médéric Longteau makes a point of naming each one who voted for Confederation. Let their memory be dark, synonymous with treason. Those whose names we mark in black must never know peace, no respite, until they're spared our hatred by death or repentance. The people of the province never vote on the resolutions themselves, but in the next general election, proponents of confederation are massively re-elected. The Rouge know they have lost. You may go to sleep on the day of confederation with all those guarantees tucked under your pillow. But will you find them there when you wake up? In the mid-1860s, the maritime colonies are booming. The American Civil War brings prosperity to every port. There is a surge in worldwide demand for ships and lumber. Samuel Cunard of Halifax has always had a good eye for ships. For a time, the Cunard fleet is the fastest and safest on the North Atlantic. When Maritimers think about the world beyond their borders, it is likely to be Liverpool or Boston, not Montreal. Few have ever done business with an upper or lower Canadian. But the Premier of New Brunswick has. Samuel Tilly comes back from Quebec City, persuaded that New Brunswick's future must be with Canada. The condition of affairs told us plainly that the provinces could not remain much longer in the present relations, and therefore it became our duty to prepare for change. Tilly's message has little resonance outside St. John. 
He holds a snap election and loses. An anti-Confederation government takes his place. In London, William Gladstone, Chancellor of the Exchequer, favors the Quebec deal. He is furious at the voters of New Brunswick. There is something almost ridiculous in the idea of their standing upon an opinion of their own in such a matter against ours and against that of Canada with five or six times the population. Orders are dispatched to set things straight. The Queen's representative in New Brunswick arranges for the upstart government to be brought down. But Tilly needs money to get re-elected. He turns to his new friend. My dear MacDonald, I think we can, with good management and means, carry a majority in the province. It will require some 40,000 or 50,000 to do the work in all our counties. In Montreal, a company with deep pockets heeds the call. The Grand Trunk Railway is keenly interested in the idea of linking Canada with the Maritimes by rail. They have plenty of friends in Montreal. Georges-Étienne Cartier is, after all, their lawyer and a senior minister in government. But the Grand Trunk needs friends in the East as well. C.J. Bridges, the railway's general manager, promises utter discretion in the campaign to re-elect Tilly. My dear MacDonald, I've sent the needful to Tilly and kept all our names here off the document. In Nova Scotia, more trouble is brewing. Charles Tupper takes pride in the deal he made in Quebec and hopes it will quietly sail through the legislature in Halifax. And it might have, except for the efforts of one man. Have we not seen enough of federations? Shall we not draw wisdom from the errors of others? For several months, readers of the Morning Chronicle are entertained by the skewering of Confederation, renamed Botheration. The letters are unsigned, but everyone knows they could only come from one very witty and learned citizen. Though no longer in office, Joseph Howe is much loved as the man who brought responsible government to Nova Scotia. Did anybody ever propose to unite Scotland with Poland or Hungary? Any Scotsman who had proposed a union of that kind would have been sent to a lunatic asylum. Yet Nova Scotians, who passed for sane men, proposed to hand over our revenues to a people who have about as much knowledge of our affairs as the Poles have of Scotland. How reflects the independent habits of Nova Scotia. The economy is strong. The shops are busy. He argues Confederation could ruin this happy equilibrium. But a new threat from the South is about to upset the balance once again. In April 1865, the world wakes up to startling headlines. With the death of Abraham Lincoln and the end of the Civil War, another kind of menace is building on the American border. Disbanded soldiers with their own scores to settle, not with the South, but with Canada. For years, the Fenian Brotherhood has been preparing to do battle with the British Army in North America, tie the enemy down, while brothers back home fight to rid Ireland of the English. Some are battle-hardened veterans of the Civil War. Others, just boys recruited off the streets of New York or Boston, barely old enough to shave. 
They are just a few hundred, but brag they will capture Canada. Militia are called up to repel them all across British North America. The son of Amelia Harris is among the volunteers. This evening, Colonel Shanley's battery of artillery and three companies of volunteers left for Sarnia. George is with them. He left such a desolate feeling behind him. The house and grounds looked lonely, but the loneliness was in my own heart. For months, the Fenians launch raids along the Canadian frontier and the New Brunswick border. They leave a few dead in their wake, buried in the fields where they fall. The Fenians are more of a psychological threat than a military one. But advocates of Confederation know the Fenians can only help their cause. Unite the colonies and build a railway, they argue. We will never again be vulnerable to outside attack. A nervous population begins to listen. Tilly and the pro-Confederationists are re-elected in New Brunswick. And in Nova Scotia, feelings swing more in favor of Confederation. Tupper arranges it so that no vote is taken on the actual Quebec deal. Instead, a resolution is passed embracing the principle of Confederation. Supporters have won the day in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and the Canadas. In Ottawa, a structure is nearly complete that looks as if it will house not just a provincial assembly, but a national parliament. Now there is one last hurdle to face across the ocean. London, November 1866. The Queen has lost her beloved husband, Prince Albert, but she is slowly returning to public life. The city is a dazzling sight for the visiting colonials. Cartier, the best tailored of the group, buys most of his clothes in London. In the best establishments, shirts are hand-woven from the finest Egyptian cotton. Cartier also orders dresses for his mistress, Luce Cuvillier. He has been having a very public affair with her for years. The two often travel overseas together. John A. MacDonald is also delighted to be back in the great city. While out on a stroll, he spots a familiar face in the crowd. Until now, Agnes Bernard has spurned his advances. He hopes she will reconsider in this exotic setting. Delegates from Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Canada have checked in at the Westminster Palace Hotel. No one has come from Newfoundland or Prince Edward Island, where the deal is in disfavor. They are here to hammer out the final details of their accord. It is complex legal work. One delegate spends time doodling. At the colonial office, Sir Frederick Rogers takes careful note of the visiting colonials. MacDonald was the ruling genius and spokesman, and I was very greatly struck by his power of management and adroitness. The French delegates were keenly on the watch for anything which weakened their securities. 
The Nova Scotia and New Brunswick delegates were very jealous of concession to the Ariad province. The slightest divergence from the narrow line already agreed on in Canada was watched for as eager dogs watch a rat hole. Only one important change to the Quebec deal is made in London. At the request of English Protestants from Quebec, a new article is quietly inserted, giving them special rights. MacDonald feels they must wrap up their work before other changes are demanded. The delays are taking their toll as he writes to his sister. My dear Louisa, for fear that an alarming story may reach you, I may as well tell you as it occurred. Cartier, Galt, and myself returned from Lord Carnarvon's place in the country late at night. I fell asleep and was awakened by intense heat. I found my bed and curtains all on fire. All the bedclothes were blazing. I then went to Cartier's bedroom and, with his assistance, carried all the water in three adjoining rooms into mine. My shirt was burnt on my back, and my hair, forehead, and hands scorched. MacDonald spends Christmas in bed with severe burns to his shoulder. By February, he has recovered enough to marry 32-year-old Agnes Bernard, whom he has finally won over. He ceases to be a widower, and she a spinster. As February turns to March, tension rises. At Westminster, the Conservative government is on the brink of falling, endangering the safe passage of the Canadian Bill. But the eloquent Colonial Secretary, Lord Carnarvon, gives the British North America Act its final push. We are laying the foundation of a great state, perhaps one which, at a future day, may even overshadow this country. But come what may, we shall rejoice that we have shown neither indifference to their wishes nor jealousy of their aspirations. On March 29th, the Queen gives her consent to the union of her British North American colonies. Canada, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick will now become the Dominion of Canada. As they make their way home, the Founding Fathers of Confederation are in a philosophical mood. No wonder the French follow political affairs in Canada with such interest. They cannot believe that we have undergone a major political revolution without spilling any blood, which they have done so prodigiously. What kind of Canada did the citizens of the New Dominion wake up to on July 1st, 1867? It depended on where they woke up. In Ottawa, John A. is now Sir John A. Macdonald, the Prime Minister of Canada. His handsome office on Parliament Hill has all the modern conveniences, gas lights and running water. His wife, Lady Agnes MacDonald, begins a new diary. This new dominion of ours came noisily into existence on the first. And the very newspapers seem hot and tired with the weight of announcements and cabinet lists. Here in this house, the atmosphere is so awfully political that sometimes I think the very flies hold Parliament on the kitchen tablecloths. In Toronto, at the Globe office, George Brown has been up all night. At 7 a.m., he finally settles on a modest 9,000-word ode to the new country. With the first dawn of this gladsome midsummer morn, we hail the birthday 
of a new nationality. Everywhere, it is a dazzling, sunny day. The citizens of Upper Canada now live in a province called Ontario. The reverberations of a brass band can be heard in every town. In Kingston, a crowd gathers to ring in the new country. In Quebec City, a cannon is fired on the Plains of Abraham. Most Canadiens will spend time by the water, happy to have a long weekend. In Montreal, La Minerve, the paper most closely associated with Cartier, describes the country he has helped bring into being. As a distinct and separate nationality, we form a state within a state. We enjoy the full exercise of our rights and the formal recognition of our national independence. In Nova Scotia, the British colonist expresses the official view. The days of isolation and dwarfhood are past. Henceforth, we are a united people, and the greatness of each goes to swell the greatness of the whole. In other quarters, the mood is distinctly truculent. An effigy of Dr. Tupper was suspended by the neck all afternoon, on the spot known as the Devil's Half Acre, and in the evening was burnt side by side with a live rat. On this July 1st, Prince Edward Islanders have little to celebrate. No agreement has been reached on buying back their farms from absentee landowners. Like Newfoundland, they have not entered Confederation for now. Not until 1873 will PEI celebrate July 1st with the rest of Canada. But on this July 1st, the night is starlit and warm, a moment never forgotten by a young girl in Hamilton, Ontario. There was the dark, and then there was the light of a candle. Then there was the opening of the great door and the rush of cool, fresh air and the deep darkness. Oh, look, said a voice. The sky was suddenly full of shooting stars. There were fountains of stars, colored red and green and blue, spraying bright balls of color into the air. There were some which tipped their colors into the air to mirror them in the water. This is the first of July in the year 1867, Father said. Always remember this day and this night. You are a very lucky little girl to be a child in Canada today. Canada, a people's history. The trials of the new dominion. The murder that tested the tolerance of a nation. A prairie province born of an armed uprising. And the completion of a dream. Canada from sea to sea.